Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and in this video I'm going to talk about proteins. Proteins are incredibly important because that's what we're made up of. When you look at me, you're looking at my proteins. We just completed the Human Genome Project and we figured out the DNA in a typical human, but now we're headed into what's called the Proteome Project, where we try to figure out what are these proteins made up of and what do they look three-dimensionally. This used to be an incredibly hard process. This is John Kendrew here putting together a model for myoglobin, and you had to do it by hand. We now do a lot of this with computers. Um, but you can help. At the end of this video, I'm going to show you a program called Fold It, and you can actually build and fold proteins that are going to be used in scientific research. And so it's a really cool thing, and it's a really cool time in reference to proteins. But let's start by building a little bit of knowledge. Proteins are made of amino acids, and most seventh graders understand this. They're the building blocks of proteins. But where do we get those amino acids? We get them in our diet. And so basically we eat proteins, we break them down into amino acids, and then we can weave those back together again into the proteins that make us. And so when you're looking at me, the amino acids in my skin used to be part of my food. And so I literally am what I eat. Now here's five different amino acids. There are a total of 20 that we use in life, but here's five basic amino acids. When I show this to uh, my students, they tend to get a little bit overwhelmed because there's too much chemistry here on one page. But let's try to figure out the things that are the same on this page. And so basically, if we were to look at the middle of each of these, we find that there's a carbon with a hydrogen attached to it. We call this carbon the alpha carbon. It's going to sit right in the middle. What else is the same in every amino acid? Well, on the left side, we have uh, nitrogen attached to two hydrogens. We call this an amino group. And then if we look on the right side, we have what's called a carboxyl group. And so basically, every amino acid is going to have these three similar parts. And so the only thing that's going to be different is going to be what comes off the bottom, and we call that the R group. Uh, and so all amino acids are the same, except what comes off here, and that gives it different properties. And so let's kind of see how they're put together. And so when I build proteins inside my body, I'm doing that with amino acids, and we use that as something called a dehydration synthesis to do that. And so let me move this one over here. Basically what we do is we position one amino acid right next to an amino acid. You can see here that there is two hydrogens and an oxygen here. And you know that in chemistry, if we have two hydrogens, H2O, that's simply a water. And so what we can do is we can lose that water. Now, it's not as simple as that. This whole thing sits inside a ribosome, so there's a giant enzyme around the outside of it. But let's attach another one. So now we bring another one right next to it. You can see that the hydroxyl group or the carboxyl group is attaching into the hydrogen. We're going to lose a water, and then we're going to form another covalent bond. And then we put another one next to it, we lose another water, we form a, a covalent bond. And we do that again, and now we have what's called a polypeptide. So each of these individually are called a peptide, but if we attach them all together, we have a polypeptide. And you can see that this strand across the top looks the same. Um, it looks uniform, but the only thing that's going to be different in each of these is going to be the R group that trails off the bottom. So where does this occur? Well, basically, these are the amino acids. This would be the ribosome in a cell, and all life does this. Basically, you have these little tRNAs that will bring their amino acids in, and then we attach them together. And when you have a bunch of amino acids attached together, you have a polypeptide, and that polypeptide will eventually fold into a protein. And so here's our five amino acid sequence right here. These are each going to have different chemical properties. And so, for example, this one right here, threonine, is going to be polar. What that means is it's going to have a charge. If we look at alanine right down the way, this is going to be nonpolar. And so why is that important? Well, if you're polar, then you're hydrophilic. That means that water is going to be attracted to you. In other words, we're going to find threonine in the presence of water. But alanine, since it's got this methyl group right here, it's not going to be attracted to the water. And so it's going to hide from the water. Or if we look at the aspartic acid, it's going to have a negative charge. And if we look at the lysine over here, it's going to have a positive charge. And so these two things, uh, or these two amino acids, are found in the same polypeptide. They're going to try to get next to each other because the positive and the negative are going to attract. And so what you end up getting is a three-dimensional protein. The middle part, so this brownish tan part in the middle, is going to be the backbone. And that's going to be, again, made up of all of the parts of the amino acid that are the same, so the amino, the alpha, and the carboxyl group over and over and over again, but all these things on the outside that are trailing off are going to be the R groups. These are going to be these residue groups that kind of fold off the end. 
And so this right here would be a polypeptide. This would be a number of different amino acids attached together. And these usually have thousands of amino acids in a typical protein, like hemoglobin would be an example of one that's found in your blood. And so basically this will fold into a three-dimensional shape. And what I tell students is a polypeptide is just going to be the sequence of those amino acids. And once it's folded into a specific shape, then we can call it a protein. And so the first, you've, you've maybe read this, there are four levels of structure in a protein. And so let me talk you through that first, and then I've got a little model that will hopefully help. And so the primary structure is going to be the order that those amino acids are bonded together. The next thing we have are what are called alpha helices and beta pleated sheets. And we call that the secondary structure. And so a helix looks like this. A beta pleated sheet is going to be two sides that are attached to each other. And these little dots in the middle are going to be hydrogen bonding between adjacent sides of that polypeptide. And so this is the structure. It comes out first. It's going to be linear. Next, we have the alpha helices, the beta pleated sheets. Then we have the tertiary structure. Tertiary, or the third level of structure, is going to be all those R groups interacting. And so maybe we have one that's hydrophobic. It'll hide to the middle or hydrophilic on the outside. We'll have disulfide bonds. We'll have positive attracting to negative. But this is the third level of structure. And then finally, we have quaternary structure. Maybe we have this one polypeptide together, or this protein, together with another protein. So hemoglobin is an example of that, made of a number of different subunits. And so here's my little model. And so if you look at this model, you can think of this being a polypeptide. So it's made up of amino acid after amino acid. And then it's going to have all the R groups on the underside. Those are going to be the only things that are different, all these R groups coming off the bottom. And so basically, primary structure like this, secondary structure is going to be the alpha helices and the beta pleated sheets. And so an alpha helix will look like this. What's holding that in place is simply going to be the hydrogen bonds. And then we're going to have a beta pleated sheet. A beta pleated sheet might look something like that. And so there's going to be hydrogen bonds between here and here. But maybe this right here is a real hydrophobic R group, and it's going to fold right to the middle. And then this might be hydrophilic. It's going to fold to the outside. We might have positive attracted to negative. And then we eventually have a three-dimensional shape of a protein. Now, this may combine with other proteins. But what's cool about proteins is their structure fits their function. If it doesn't have this structure, if we heat it up, if we cool it, if we change the acidity, basically it'll fold apart. We call that denature, and then it doesn't work anymore.